We are so glad that you're here today. We greet all of you in the name of the Lord. Those that are watching online, we're glad that you are with us today. Those that will be watching, we're going to get right to it. Look over at your neighbor. Now say this with love. Say this with a smile. And then I'll give you some clarification on it. Look over at your neighbor and tell them you look a little puffy this morning. <laughs> you look a little puffy this morning. That's the reaction I was kind of expecting right there. All right. Well, today we're going to talk about pride. And Scripture says that pride puffs up. It puffs up. Anybody ever get a little puffy with somebody? Yeah, well, that's not really a question. I already know the answer, right? Right? And, and so, uh, so pride, you, you know, there's some things that you can be proud of, and, and it can be in a good way uh, in, in the context of the Apostle Paul says, the boast that I make, I boast in the Lord. And, and, so, and so it was, it's, it's not a pride of some overinflated ego, right? Everybody knows that pride, right? That, that, that worldly pride. There's a pride that has to do with, you know, taking pride in your work and you want to do a good job because it honors God and you just should do a good job. So those, those things, that's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the flip side, the uglier side of pride. And so today... We're going to draw some contrast between wisdom and pride. We're going to talk about how pride comes and uh, how it works in the antidote uh, that God has given us to pride. And then next week we'll hook on to the same thing. So today's, today's message, the title is Wisdom and Pride. Everybody say Wisdom and Pride. Wisdom. Next week, and so we're going to talk a little bit about prophecy. Uh, next week's message will be uh, prophecy and wisdom's preparation. And so we're still on the wisdom series. And so if we can, Kathy, I'd like to get up Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4. And I'm going to share just a line out of a passage that we'll read here just a little bit. But we're going to look at Revelation chapter 6 and verse 4. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 says this, Know also that in the last days... Perilous times will come. We're going to talk about some things we need to know today. And you need to know that in the last days, perilous times will come. Everybody say they will come. It's prophetic. It's Paul writing to Timothy and giving him instruction prophetically. Now, it doesn't matter much which preacher you listen to right now. Uh, if, if they are a truly born-again evangelical type Christian uh, minister, pastor, evangelist, teacher, whatever, most of them, I, I could just keep hearing it resounding and resounding and resounding that we're in the last days. Now listen, uh, I'm knocking on 64 right now. Not a record, but I've got a few memories in the past. And uh, I have, uh, I've been hearing that all my life. Any of you old folks say the same thing? Yeah, I've been hearing it forever. And it's true. It was true then. See, the way God does math is really different than the way we do math. Pastor Scott just talked about God bless this offering with your God math. And God's math looks like this. You know, he takes two loaves or, or, or two fish and five loads and feeds 5,000 men, not to mention the women and children and all that. I like God's math. How about you? Hey, man, it's good stuff. And so when he says a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, then that's God's math. And so if we look from where the church age began with Jesus somewhere roughly 33 A.D. And a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day, then we're a couple of days on past where the church started. And so we're looking for the day of the Lord. It's what prophecy teaches us. We're going to dig into this deeper next week. But I want to kind of just set a stage for what we're going to be looking at. Because one of the things, what pride does, we'll read it in, in Proverbs 13 in a little bit. Only through pride comes contention. That's the first line of that passage. Only through pride comes contention. So through pride, through arrogance, through self-righteousness comes strife. And division, contention, and so those, those things right there. And so the enemy in, in Revelation chapter 6, 
And, and so I'm just going to touch on a little bit of what we're going to build on more next week. But I have this message is an encouragement and a warning. And you, you take it as that, you receive it. However, in this context, there has, how many of y'all know as long as there's been human beings, there's been strife and there's been division and contention, right? It started in the garden. And you need to know that whenever the enemy comes in to create division, it's always to separate you from God. It hadn't changed. The original goal was to separate Adam and Eve in the garden. It's still the same goal. It hadn't changed. He hates you. He despises you. You're made in the image of God. And anything that reminds him of God, the one that kicked him out of heaven, right? He don't like. And so he's going to fight against you. Here's what we're going to see. And I'll just speak this to you by what I see in the things of prophecy. You judge it. You measure it for yourself. In the last days, we're going to see things that we're familiar with. That's always been around. But you're going to see them on the increase. You're going to see more division. You're going to see more strife. You're going to see those things increase in the last days. Perilous times will come. He said, know this. We're going to talk about it. I've got several things that you need to know that the Bible tells us. These are not my words. These are not your words. These are recorded in Scripture for us to know. And so, number one, know that... How many of all believe that we're in the last days? Let's poll the audience, right? In that context, how many of all feel like that you're under an attack right now? Just you. And it's okay. Raise your hand, right? Yeah, if, you, if it's you. How many of all feel like you know somebody that's under major attack, right? Sure. And so it's extremely... So how do we deal with when there is strife and when there is division? How do we... Anybody here ever been offended? Everybody, anybody here ever been the offender? <laughs> Only two of you. All right. Well, I'm going to preach to you two. Just teasing. There are, four ga- there are four categories that I want to teach on offense today. There is the offender... There is the offended. There is the one who is offended but refuses to accept the offense. Everybody say water off a duck's back. Huh? It's not that you wasn't offended. It's not that they weren't offensive. But you did not let it get hold of you, steal your peace, and set the trajectory for the rest of your life. Hmm? And then there are some of you who don't have enough drama in your life, so you borrow offenses. That's the fourth category. Some of you thrive on drama. You're a bunch of pot stirs. Well, I know nobody here, but if you're watching today, all right, how about that? They can't stone me through the camera. That's a good thing. All right. Um, Dear brother, sister, I've got a prayer request. It ain't a prayer request. It's gossip. It just tail bearing a lot of the time. If you got a prayer request, you don't have to tell the whole story. Anybody say amen? Amen. (laughs) Woo! This is going better than I thought it would already. I'm getting some good amens on this one. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Revelation. Let's look at prophecy for just a minute. Revelation 6 verse 4. There are four horses that are released in the first few verses of Revelation chapter 6. Um, Horses in this context represent a powerful spirit that is moving. How many of y'all believe that the Holy Spirit is a powerful spirit? And from Genesis chapter 1, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, right? So we see the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is a mover. Here's what you're going to see more and more in these perilous times in the last days. You're going to see and you're going to be surrounded by, and this is not a story of defeat or fear. This is a story of victory, but you've got to go into the battle with the right frame of mind. You're going to see more demonic activity than you've ever seen in your life. It's here and it's coming. Even in greater detail. 
So the first horse that we look like, or that we look, hope we don't look like this one, <clears throat> that we look at is a white horse. Now this horse is carrying a rider that has a bow, not a sword, but a bow, and a crown, representing authority, representing a weapon. And he goes forth to conquer and is conquering. That's verse 2. And this horse represents Antichrist. I believe that the spirit, John talked about the spirit of Antichrist, and we'll get to it next week. But the spirit of Antichrist has been working for a long, long time. This is nothing new. But we're going to see it intensify in these last days. Everybody say intensify. As things intensify, what can happen is you can get caught and sucked into that vacuum. It creates a vacuum, and if you're not careful, you'll get sucked in. And, and so as we, as we look at this and we begin to know and to realize this and to understand what the enemy's plan is in this thing, then God's going to use you to make a difference in this dark world. The second horse that we see is this horse in chapter, or, uh, chapter 6, verse 4. Everybody say the red horse. There went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon. Everybody say he's got power. I ain't going to brag on the enemy, but that's what the Word of God says. And so if he's got power, then that means if he's working in conjunction with this one that's going on the white horse to conquer and is conquering, there's going to be some people get taken advantage of in this thing. I don't intend for this congregation or for this flock to be any of those. I intend for you to walk in victory. And so we're going to have to be wise. Wisdom or pride. Wisdom or pride. Now I want you to look at this verse right here. He was given unto him that sat thereon. And what did he do? It was given him power to take peace from the earth. Isn't that what division and strife does? It takes peace. Out of your heart. Now we've talked about this domino effect for years and years. We've taught this for a long, long time. Here's what happens. If you lose your peace, you'll lose your joy. You lose your joy, next domino, right? You lose your strength. Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord's our strength, right? Just going to go through it one time right here. And so if you lose your peace, you lose your joy, you lose your joy, you lose your strength. You lose your strength, you lose the battle. And if you lose enough battles, you'll lose the war. Hmm? Everybody say, protect your peace. Luke um, chapter 17, verse 1. Luke 17, verse 1. Luke 17, verse 1. This is Jesus' words. We're going to build on this more today now and next week as well. Then he said unto his disciples, and again, this is red letter, it is impossible that offenses will come. You need to know this. Offenses will come. Everybody say they will. They will. Hmm? It's true. How many of y'all have ever been offended at one time or another? We live in an offensive world. Let me ask you this. Do you see any of that increasing here lately? Offenses will come. But now here's the next thing you need to know. But woe. Woe unto them by which it comes. Jesus, and we'll read it next week. We'll actually go into Matthew 18. And you can, you can look at that. Matthew 18 and 1. And reading through verse 11 next week. And it talks more about this story. And he takes a child. He said, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom was the question. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And Jesus took a little child and set him on his knee. And said, if you're going to be the greatest in the kingdom, you've got to be converted and become as a little child. Listen to me. There's a difference in being childlike and childish. That's really good preaching deal. Stay after it. I'll encourage myself. Childish. When you become childish, you're easily offended or you become an offender. Or you're a pot stirrer. Here's what happens when the spirit of division begins to work. Romans 8.35 familiar. We all like Romans 8, 28, right? All things work together for the good of them that love God, right? We all love that's good. Great. I love it too. Romans 8, 35. 
Who shall separate us? It's a question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? From the love of God. If you're separated from the love of Christ, you're separated from the love of God, right? You can't separate those two. And so that was the design of the sin or of the offense or of the temptation in the garden was to create separation. And when that separation was created, what was the first thing that happened? Adam and Eve got right into it, didn't they? God, you need to know it was that woman. She's the one to eat me out of house and home, right? It was that woman, and she's going to pass the blame on. No, it was that snake. He's the one, and it creates division. It created contention. But the end design, and we're still dealing with the after effects today, aren't we? Of that sin and that failure and that fall in the garden. And so, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You need to know that that's always the end game of the enemy. Is to separate you from the love of God. But it doesn't stop there. See, the thief comes to steal. He comes to kill and he comes to destroy. I've taught this multiple times. I'm going to go through it once more today. In the spirit of division... In this demonic uptick that we will see in the last days, in these perilous times, in that demonic uptick, what you will see is you will see a division, a spirit of division. This red horse that has been given power to take peace from the earth, if that's what's prophetically going to happen in the last days, it's not just flipping a switch and all of a sudden that happens. There will be a move. Things can happen suddenly. How many of y'all remember 2020? Right? And the world changed dramatically on a dime. But most of the time, when the Spirit begins to work, and we're talking about, listen, he said to take peace from the earth. Everybody say global. Global. Matthew 24. Wars, rumors of wars, right? Pestilence, earthquake, famine. And he said, listen, this is what he said, verse 8. He said, these are the beginning, the beginning of sorrows. If you go on past that, um, this tribulation thing that's coming is a really big deal. Now, I am a pre-tribulational rapture preacher. That's where I'm at. Um, I don't think God's mad at his uh, children. I don't think uh, Jesus is mad at his bride. But I don't know. Here's what I do know from the time that what I believe. (laughs) The difference in us being here. And the rapture occurring is the blink of an eye. I don't know how rough it gets before Jesus comes. And, and, and here's the, if you have to go all the way through the tribulation, if, if we need to, if that's where it goes, we'll take the worst road, worst scenario, then you ought to even be more prepared. Huh? So it's applicable wherever you sit. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, no-trib. If you're no trib, you need to read the book. <laughs> okay. In, in looking at these things, the way that this spirit of separation, this spirit of division works, there are five different levels that you can identify. I've watched it on personal levels. I've watched it in marriages. I've watched it in churches in so many different ways. The first thing that that spirit begins to do, that roaring lion begins to seek those whom he may devour. And so the lion comes into the flock and he starts trying to cut out the weak, the easily offended, the old, the lame, the whatever. And he creates separation and he makes you vulnerable. Everybody say vulnerable. Separation. Phase one. Phase two is isolation. If he can cut you out from the flock, then he isolates you. Now listen to me. When you get offended, you get hurt. It's a natural response that when you get hurt to draw back and to isolate yourself. Is that true? Absolutely true. When you're the offender and the Spirit of God convicts you about that and you feel guilty and you feel shame for being the offender, it's a natural thing to pull back and to isolate yourself because you're embarrassed. You should be embarrassed, but you shouldn't let the devil isolate you. Hmm? If you're a pot stirrer, now listen to me. If you're a pot stirrer, sooner or later everybody will figure you out and they ain't going to want nothing to do with you. 
Is that true? You dead going skippy, that's true. And you'll be isolated. And it'll be hard to win back those friends that you've created division with. Hmm? Listen to me. If that pot stirrer is coming to you talking about somebody else, don't, think you, don't you think for a minute that they won't take your trash and throw it in front of somebody else and throw you under the bus. Separation, phase one. Isolation is phase two. The third phase is domination. At this point, you're isolated. You're away from God. You've created separation. Matter of fact, you may be like Adam and Eve trying to hide yourself from God. Hmm? You're separated from the flock, from the rest of the church. Those that will love you, those that will pray with you, those that will stand with you, whether you're offended, the offender, or the pot stirrer. If you're the one that can say, yep, been offended, but it's going to take more than that to get me derailed. I'm just going to keep on going. I mean, I don't know. That's what maturity does. It's not that the offense is not legitimate, but you've become wise enough. Everybody say wisdom or pride. It's not that you didn't get offended. It's just that you have enough wisdom to say, listen, I'm not going to let that get seeded into my heart. I'm going to just keep focused on what I need to keep focused on. I'm going to keep fighting the good fight of faith. And I'm not going to. And so I know how to walk in forgiveness even when it hurts. And, and here's what I know about forgiveness. I'll have to make a choice by my will and take an act and a step of faith to forgive. And the feelings will follow later on. Hmm? The feelings will follow. A lot of people don't think they've forgiven because they don't feel like they have. Okay. In the domination phase, the enemy's whispering in your, in, in your mind, into your ear. See, he's been given power to take peace. He'll steal your peace. And when he steals your peace and he starts whispering in your ear, and he says, listen, God don't love you no more. You ain't never going to get out of this pit. You're never going to be able to get over this one right here. It's just hurt too bad or you've hurt him too bad. There's no way. I wonder what the devil was whispering in David's ear when he figured out God had busted him over having Uriah murdered. Huh? You can read the story, right? <laughs> I've been found out. I committed adultery with Bathsheba. I sent her husband to the front line in this big hot battle, and I gave order for everybody else to abandon him and leave him up there, and he got killed. He gave the order for a hit on Uriah. If you want to know what it felt like, read Psalm 51. God restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I am so broken. Psalm 51 is David's prayer when he had so offended not only Uriah but himself and his God. Domination phase, the enemy starts whispering in your ear and he'll start taking you down lower and lower and lower and lower and he'll bring you to the phase. The fourth phase is termination. At termination, it might be that you terminate your own life but it could be that you terminate a relationship or that you terminate completely your relationship with God. God, God don't love me. God don't care about me. I'm just done. There's another one. And this is the fifth phase. And I, I, I call it annihilation is the way I teach it or when I'm counseling with someone. Here's the word that scripture uses when Jesus was teaching about a house divided against itself. Anybody remember that? And again, we're just, we're just kind of going through this. Every house that's divided against itself, every city that's divided against itself, every nation that's divided against itself, this is the word he said, is brought to desolation. Everybody say desolation. So you can put desolation in there. That's the, actually the scriptural word. For it. Annihilation means the thing. But annihilation to us really has a context of just. But we also all know what desolate means. If you're looking at something that's just desolate, what's there? Nothing. The ripple effect of what hell wants to do is not just to rob your peace or your joy, but to get such strife and such bitterness. To the point where it escalates 
to the point where it's just desolation. And if you fall into that trap, that vacuum, you'll find yourself on the opposite side of where God wants you to be. Anybody say amen? God has a plan for us to be able to live beyond that. You can walk in love and you can walk in forgiveness. Now I want to make something really clear to you. <clears throat> I'm not talking about just being passive and being the devil's doormat. Well, I'm just going to let everything slide. Here's what you... Pastor Scott already said, listen, you've got to fight for your faith. You have to fight for your faith. Here's what the Apostle Paul wrote. He wrote to Timothy. He said, I've, huh, I've fought the good fight of faith. Everybody say fight. fight. You've got to fight. You have to stand. But now listen to me. You don't fight in such a context that you allow what is motivating that fight to be bitterness or to be revenge or to be anger. But if it... If it is an anger, it must be a righteous anger. But you're not allowing something that is vengeful and ugly and hurtful. We'll use some, we'll, we'll use some, some other uh, things to kind of teach this just here in a little bit as we get a little bit further into this. So this red horse, I believe, has begun to move in greater dimension in our world today. The power he's been given is to take peace from the earth. So in a global context, how many of y'all can see some escalation of violence at a global level and, and, and things that, and it's not that there haven't been wars and all those kinds of things. It's just that we're seeing what's always been escalate. It is a barometer of a change in the environment. And I believe that we're in the last days. Maybe the last of the last days. You, you measure it for yourself. I see so many Christians under so many different attacks and the war is on. You have to fight. There's another line that Paul wrote to Timothy. Fight the good fight of faith. There might be a bad fight of faith then if he said fight the good fight of faith. Here's what he wrote to the Corinthian church, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare. by say warfare. There's a war on. And the fences will come. How are you going to fight that fight and keep your heart in the right place? Number one, you've got to know who your enemy is. Everybody say, know the enemy. <laughs> huh? We don't war with flesh and blood. You're in war with a red horse and the rider on it. And he's been given power to take peace from the earth. And you're going to see a continual escalation of that. Let's finish reading 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and starting at verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. That word perilous, violent, extremely violent and fierce is a more in-depth definition of that word. Perilous times. Great peril. It's dangerous. It's violent. It's exceedingly fierce. We're moving toward that. We're moving. Listen, the book of Revelation and every prophecy in it will be fulfilled. You mark it down. It will come. What a time to be alive and on planet earth and be a Christian. Huh? Woo! You just well as to, listen, you just well as to saddle up and get your spurs on because you're going to go for a ride. There's another one coming on a white horse, amen? He ain't the Antichrist, he is the Christ. How many of y'all believe? Hey, how about this? Don't we need to know he's coming back? So this is not about defeat. There's a difference in the horse taking you for a ride and you taking the horse for a ride. How many of y'all know that? Woo. If you ever had a Shetland pony in your life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Demon possessed from birth. Meanest horse on the face of the earth and is about that tall and wider than me. Anyway, <clears throat> we'll move right on. Let's talk about men being lovers of their own selves. Here's a 
Here's a biblical definition of pride, a scriptural definition. Pride is extreme love and focus on oneself. What's the first thing? Here's the first thing. Here's what's happening because of perilous times. Men shall be lovers of their own self. Let's talk about that in an amplifier. They have pride. They are arrogant. They have an extreme love and a complete focus on themselves. It stems from self-righteousness and overinflated self-worth or value, conceit, or it could even be a mask, listen to this, for insecurity. <laughs> I act like a pit bull, but in reality, I'm a chihuahua. <laughs> and hairless at that. <laughs> Maybe not, but you understand the, the difference. All it is, they talk big, but it's just a mask for insecurities. And it's because they don't want to look small. They want to feel like they got to fit in. Listen, you know what makes you acceptable? Because Jesus died for you. Live with that. Be happy with that. Be joyful with that. Be at peace with that. Now then, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Sounds like the newspaper, doesn't it? Without natural affection, truce barkers, false, continent, or false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, love of the, uh, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. That one chaps me. Apparently, these people come to church. And that's a good thing if they will repent. Everybody say repent. See, the, 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 key, the key is... Is if you've, if you've been caught up in this vacuum of this red horse that's taking peace and you're a pot stirrer or you're an offender or you're just holding on to your offense, then what you have to do, and it's, listen, it's a whole lot easier for me to preach it than it is for me to live it. I'm going to tell you a story. I won't give you any names or a time frame. It's, quite a, it's, it's a long time ago in my Christian walk. And I'm learning this lesson right here. And I'm not going to tell you still it's an easy lesson to walk in to be able to be offended. Legitimately, something comes along that really hurts you. And it hurts you deep. I had an offense years and years ago. This is a true story. A long time ago. And um, I was angry. But God's trying to teach me how to pray for those who are offensive, to those who despitefully use you, to those that this, this, and this. I mean, all that pray for your enemy thing is not an easy one to walk in sometimes, huh? So I prayed this prayer. So here's something that you need to know. Now listen to me, offenders and pot stirrers, borrowed offenses. It's not like you don't have enough drama in your own. What? You are sick. If you don't have, I don't know, baby, I've got enough drama in my, anyway, moving on. Here's what the Bible says. You finish this line for me. You reap. Woo. That can be good seed or bad, can't it? Mm. And so I'm knowing this and God's teaching me early on and I'm, I can tell you that I have made a habit for 40 years of ministry of praying God Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom, God. I wake up in ministry just about every day of my life in way over my head. God, if you don't help me today, we drown. I need wisdom. I need your wisdom. Let me see through your eyes. So he's teaching me about the laws of sowing and reaping. He's teaching me about how to pray for those that are offensive. If I quit every time I got offended in the ministry, I'd have quit a long time ago, my friends. You better develop a thick skin to protect your soft heart. Don't you let your heart get hard. But you'll have to have a thick skin. I prayed this prayer. I prayed it once. I'll never pray it again. God, I know that this person that's offended me so much That they're going to reap what they're going to, what they've sowed, they're going to reap it. And this was the prayer. And I want to see it. Um. 
I know what God's voice sounds like. I've heard him speak to me before. And as sure as he ever spoke to me, he spoke to me that day when I prayed that prayer. As soon as I finished that prayer, and he said, you're going to see it. And it will break your heart. <laughs> Turns out God's always right. And this is a true story. It's a hard lesson learned. You be smarter than me. I've never seen any more hurt. I've seen as much, but I ain't never seen any more hurt than that individual went through. And it finally come to a point where I cried for him, and I don't cry much. You need to know if you're a chronic offender or you're a chronic pot stirrer, you will reap what you sow when you don't want that. I promise you, you don't want to see it. And you for sure don't want to live it. I'll never pray that prayer again. Heavy enough? Yeah. Listen, this is a big deal to God. We're going to get into it just a little more. Having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Now listen to me. From such turn away. When they're walking in these things and you see these things, now listen to me. How many of y'all ever seen somebody who was an offensive individual really truly get saved and live the way they should? Isn't that a beautiful thing when that happens? Might possibly even be that you're one of those. Anybody know what that means? Me too? Okay. I'm talking to the right crowd. I've seen it, Ricky. I've seen it, Ricky. Ricky's over here doing this. When it talks about turning away, it's not turning away in a rejection, and I reject you, and I refuse you, and I'll turn away from you. It's just I'm not going to get sucked in and following that way that you're going. But what I want to do, see, I'm going to protect my heart and I'm going to fight the good fight and I'm going to learn how to pray for you and I'm going to learn how to walk in forgiveness toward you. And if my feelings don't come for a while, it's okay because I can make that choice and do that because it is that. It is a choice. Huh? And so turn away in the context of I'm not going to get sucked into that demonic vacuum that they're caught in. There's a lot of things going on in this world today. I want to plug for something that is offensive to some. Uh, amendment 3 is coming up. And it's, a, it's an amendment. There's information back there on the back. It's an amendment to our Constitution to uh, enshrine abortion into the American Constitution from now on. And it becomes constitutional. Isn't it funny that the people who are always trying to destroy the Constitution want to put something into the Constitution? <clears throat> now I want you to hear me. Now listen to me. I have counseled with a lot of people, women who have had abortions. I have counseled with fathers whose girlfriend or wife or whoever paid for the abortion or whatever. And there was guilt and there was shame and there's hurt and there's offense and there's all those things. I don't turn away from them or even in some cases an abortion provider. I'm not turning away from them as an individual. I would love to see them get saved in Jesus' name. I would love to see true repentance and for them to come and to follow the path of righteousness. You can't counsel somebody that you turn away from and turn your back on and walk off and say, well, you can just go to hell. Straight enough? Straight up. That's not our call. Jesus hanging on the cross, look at the ones that nailed him there. Hmm? This forgiveness thing's a big deal, isn't it? It's big enough said, if you don't do it, I won't forgive you. It's a big deal. We've talked about that before. It's... Here's what you, and again, 
I want you to see that there's an increase and to understand exactly what's going on in these perilous times. Uh, Psalm 111, verse 10. Let's talk about wisdom. I want to take you back to day one when we started this series. Psalm 111, verse 10. <clears throat> Everybody say wisdom or pride. Wisdom or pride. Here's the line I want you to get from this one right here. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you have reverence and respect to God, that's where wisdom starts. That's where wisdom begins. When you say, I am so angry, God. I know they're going to reap what they sowed, and I want to see it. Well, you're going to, but you're not going to enjoy it. <laughs> Boy, he was right. I would have told you I had the fear of God, respect and reverence to God, and I could quote you the scripture. But I ask amiss. Anybody ever read that James thing? Yeah. Well, if you haven't, we're going to read it in a little bit. Proverbs 8.13. We're going to run through some pretty quick, so stay with me. Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride. Everybody say pride. pride. When God... Who is love uses a word that is so strong, hate. How offensive is it to holiness and righteousness when God, who is love, says, I hate that. That's strong language, gang. Listen to me. What I'm talking about right now and in the time that we live in, in this culture, in this day, in this global atmosphere that we're living in spiritually... This red horse takes peace from the earth, global. Don't get sucked in on all this demonic activity that is on the increase. It's not just at your house or in your family. It's not just in your church or in your town, in your state or in your politics, in your nation. I'm speaking these words today so that we can protect our unity, church. This is not my church. This is God's. You're God's. The building ain't the church. The people are the church. You're God's. You're not mine. You're God's. I'm your shepherd, but you belong to God. This is our church. This is our flock. This is God's flock and we need to protect one another rather than devour one another. Amen? There's enough devouring going on. Now listen. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. Whew. Proverbs 6.16. We even get to stronger language here. Really strong language. Proverbs 6.16. 6, These six things does the Lord hate. Mm. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. When God says hate, it's at one level. When he talks about something that is an abomination, it is absolutely so vile. It is so corrupt. It is so... Listen, I'm going to put it just as straight as I can... Every time you read abomination, and it has to do with the context of the holiness and the righteousness of God, abomination brings damnation. Whew. You'll never read it any other way, not in this book. The abomination of desolation is what Daniel talks about, which will happen in the three and a half, in three and a half years into the tribulation. And it's when the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple of God, acting like he is the Christ. 
and there's this great statue, this great being that's set up there, and everybody's going to come and worship. It's an abomination to worship anything but God. I won't have no other gods before me is what he said. I'm a jealous God. I won't tolerate it. I won't put up with it. It's not because he's trying to be mad and because he needs to heap it on himself and he's got like a fragile ego and he's insecure. It's because we need to know that there's only one God. There's only one way to heaven. There ain't no other way to get there. And if you don't worship him, you die and go to hell. And he don't want that because he loves you. Hmm. These six things the Lord hates, seven are abomination. Number one, everybody read it with me. Proud look. How many of y'all ever had that stare down at you? Anybody ever got that one? Sure you have. Sure you have. There's a lot of people in this world who feel really good about themselves. <laughs> Woo. Lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. Amendment 3. A heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet that are swift running to mischief. A false witness that speaks lies. And listen to me. I'm going to hit on this one some. And he that sows discord among the brethren. As pastor for... Um, bunch of years now I've kept things very simple in the context of my primary job is to lead the flock, feed the flock and protect the flock hmm? do not sow discord in this church don't do it don't do it you guys don't get off easy either. Don't do it. Don't sow discord in this church. I love you. And I'll feed you. And I'll lead you. And I'll do everything I can to protect you. And that's what I'm doing now. Because you sow discord. God's had his hand on this church for a long time. That don't make us special. That makes us call. We got a job to do and we ain't got time to be all offended. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of time and a lot of energy to be offended. Amen? You don't want to reap that seed that's being sowed. Don't sow discord. I love you guys too, but you don't get off the hook either. Don't you sow discord in this church. I love you. And here's what, the, here's what the Word says for me to do. Here's my job. Here's what the gospel is given for. Here's what the Word of God is given for. It's given for correction, Amen. for reproof. Amen. Anybody know the rest of it? Instruction in righteousness. Amen. And I can assure you that I love you enough that I will correct, I will reprove, and I will instruct in righteousness. And I'm not a perfect being, and I have no qualifications to do that other than God put me here. And for anybody that's watching... If you're part of our online congregation, you're in the very same boat. Don't sow discord. Look over at your neighbor and tell them, just don't do it. Is that true? Is that fair enough? No, listen, we have our hands filled with a real enemy. Nobody sitting next to you is the enemy. Here's the old cliche. You help me. If you can't say something good... My, you guys are good preachers. That takes some of the pressure off of me. Thank you. Psalm 10, 4. Psalm 10 and verse 4. I love this one. I love one of the translations of this. Psalm 10, 4 says, The wicked through pride of his countenance will not seek God. Pride causes us to not seek God. Can you see that? Because he don't think he needs God. As a matter of fact, he's so full of himself. Here's the way one translation says it. He's so full of himself, there's no room for God. Woo. I know you have never been that person that was really full of yourself. But if you meet one of them this week, you just take them to Psalm 10 and verse 4. 
They will not seek God. God is not in all of his thoughts. Next verse. Proverbs 16, 18. We, we know this and we hear it quoted a lot. Pride goes before destruction. You know what we're talking about? Desolation. Annihilation. These are the... These are, this is the end run of pride. And it has so many different ways that it manifests itself. All the way from this self-inflated ego and arrogant and that prideful look. To the person who's really just insecure. But they act like all this and everything in between. There's a big difference in wisdom and pride. Let's walk in wisdom. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. I don't know about you, but I've got enough scars on my knees. I fell enough. I just seem to be standing. I think that's what the scripture said. Having done all to stand, do what? Stand. Proverbs 11, 2. Proverbs 11, 2. Well, this one is straight on. We're just looking at some of the characteristics of pride and some of the end run on pride. When pride comes, everybody say pride comes. Yes. Right? You can get to feeling pretty good about yourself if you don't keep yourself in check. <laughs> right? And there are some things, again, if you're a craftsman, take, take pride in your work. Do a good job. Right? Whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. Right? Do it well. But when pride comes, I started to use the story of Samson and really go through it and break it down bit by bit. I'm going to give you a really quick overview of the story of Samson. Samson is a picture of the church today in a lot of ways because it is flirting with and in love with the world. The Philistine women, right? No Philistine women here, so we're not going to offend anybody. Any Philistines here today? Okay, thank God. All right. I know there's a bunch of Gentiles here, but thankfully there's no Philistines in here. Samson had a love for alluring women. This is in a natural context to teach us a spiritual truth. And so there were no... How many of y'all know the scripture says don't be unequally yoked, right? Righteousness with unrighteousness, light with dark, right? And so in the context of this... What the, what the story of Samson teaches, you got this mighty man who has a call on his life to be a judge, to lead the people of Israel in a righteous path, and he's going to judge, and he's going he's to lead them, and, and they're going to be conquerors over the Philistines, but he gets caught up in how pretty he is. His long hair looks like Fabio, right? And some of you are younger, don't know who that is. He's kind of a really good-looking, girly guy, and so anyway... I said that out loud. Doggone it. Okay. Some of you in love with Fabio, I know. I thought I was going to do it one time, Clay, but it was turned out to be Flabio. So anyway, it's all good. It wasn't nearly as impressive, okay? So where was I at with Samson on that? Forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to be on track here. Focus, DL. He wouldn't check himself up. He knew he... See, he's in covenant with God. He knows he's in covenant with God. But he keeps breaking covenant in the context of I'm going to go and run with who I shouldn't be going with and running with. And he won't check himself up. If you won't check yourself up, here's what happened next with Samson. The people that loved him, his mom and his dad come to him and they, check, they tried to check him up. But he wouldn't hear them. And so after that, then the man of God comes to him and he wouldn't check himself up. See, mom and dad couldn't do it for him. They knew what to do, but they couldn't do it for him. Nobody can do this for you. If you want to be offended and all mad, and, right, you can. You can twist off and go do whatever. People can't do it for you. Mom and dad couldn't do it. The man of God come. What happened was he fell into the hands of his enemy. See, he's out of covenant. His hair's cut, right? He's done a whole bunch of things to get himself out of covenant. And so while he's out of covenant, listen to what the enemy does. In the natural, Samson was blinded. I see a lot of good people that God loves at one time walked with God, and they can't see a thing now. 
They're as blind as they can be. Pride will blind you. Arrogance will blind you. This overinflated self-worth. And here's what happened. Like an ox, day after day at the grinding wheel. He's grinding food for his enemies. And he's feeding the Philistines. And the longer you stay away from God, the more feed you will supply to hell. And the ripple effect of that is desolation. Thank God Samson come back. Got focused. It cost him a bunch. He was a great underachiever. But he came back. And at least in the last, he wound up victorious over the enemy of God. It's a picture of the church today. We're about to finish. When pride comes, verse 2, chapter 11, Proverbs. When pride comes, then comes shame. What do you think that strong man felt like day after day? Can't see anymore. Look at him. Let's laugh at him. Ha, ha, ha. How about it now, big man? Wasn't too prideful that day. If you won't check yourself up, you'll fall into the hands of your enemy. And I watched it one time. I have watched it more than one time. But there was one time I thought I wanted to watch it. I didn't. I take no satisfaction in watching anyone else suffer. I learned another lesson that day. I could never hurt them enough to make me feel better. So just leave off the whole revenge thing. It ain't all it's cracked up to be. You let God deal with it. Don't get distracted. You got a job to do. That's all hell wanted to do. Take you off. Take you off and get you on the sidelines of hurt and pain and shame, embarrassment, humiliation, all those things. When pride comes, and it does, you need to know that shame comes with him. But with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 13 and 10. Now I'm going to read my text. How about that? Here's the text. Proverbs 13, 10. Only by pride. Only by pride comes contention. Here's where strife and division. Strife and division comes through one form or another of pride. And there are a lot of forms. From the big ego to the insecure. And every definition, everyone in between. But it'll come through pride. Only by pride comes contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. Listen to me. When you're dealing with someone who is prideful, they already think they know enough. They'll never receive advice. Amen. Anybody say amen? amen? They're so full of themselves and they're already so, they know it all. So you can't tell them anything. That's the story of Samson. And we can talk it time after time. <clears throat> James 4, 1 and we're done right here. James 4 1. We're done for today. I'm going to pick up here next week. James 4 1. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Where do they come from? Where's all this offense and this tug of war? And all this, where does it come from? Hmm. Your lust that war in your own members. Hmm. My focus is on me. Let me ask you something. Jesus is the perfect model of how not to live this James. Chapter 4 verse 1 right here. Right? He's the perfect model of this right here. And, and, and so, he's teaching us how to avoid. He's in conflict. He's in war. Isn't that true? But he still walks this war out in the context of, I'm on the cross and the ones that nail me and I'll still forgive you. Does that challenge anybody but me?
It, it challenges me. You lust and you have not. You kill. You say, well, I've never murdered anybody. I don't kill. Well, murder's a real thing, but sometimes murder don't just happen. Sometimes you assassinate somebody's character. Let me talk to the pot stirrers again. Huh? You got it. Right? Whispers and backpipes. Hey, did you know what? You just have no idea how evil this Betty gal is at church. If you know Betty, this is the sweetest woman in Westside Church. Actually, there's two of them here together. It's sweetness squared right here. I didn't hear that, but did you know about Anne? You girls still love you, preacher? I love you. Don't you be talking about You correct me. That's right. You get on me. That's right. Ann got right back in the preacher's face on that one right there. Good girl. Everybody got it? Okay. You lust and you have not. You kill. Don't assassinate somebody else's character. You don't know what they're going through. I want to ask you, anybody here going through a trial? Anybody here in a battle? Anybody here in a war? Don't pile on. Don't pile on. They need somebody to help them on. Amen? You desire and cannot obtain. You fight war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you can consume it on your own uh, lust. You adulterers and adulteresses. And it's not just talking about the physical sin. It's talking about a spiritual sin by which you're embracing in adultery as the bride of Christ, you're, in, you're embracing the spirit of Antichrist, not the Christ. I don't have time to go into that in detail today. We're done. Know you not that the friendship of the world is the enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture said in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy, but he gives more grace? Thank you. Jesus, where sin abounds. Anybody thankful for grace today? Where sin abounds. Okay, now listen, now listen. Yeah, we'll, we'll clap for grace in a minute. We love it when we receive grace. It's a really good thing when you can give grace. Is that true? Now you can clap for grace. Receive it and give it. Receive it and give it. Okay, last verse. Let's finish it up. He gives more grace. Where he say, God resists the proud. Anybody want to be in the place where God's resisting your prayers in these last days? Pastor Scott touched on it. I don't want to face these last days without walking with God. But it gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. And he'll flee from you, draw near to God. Let's draw near to God. No music today. No fanfare. Right where you're sitting at. I want you just to get real. I just said some really offensive lies about these two ladies. Let me show you what this looks like. Betty, Ann, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I forgive you, yes. How about that? And I hadn't even given her the notes on the sermon. I think it's in her. Thanks for playing today. I'll get you a check in the mail. I got to read this. This not I'm done scripture, rise. This little piece right here, that's the altar call. Some of you need to repent to God and apologize to someone. I'm sorry. Some of you need to accept the apology. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Betty, for accepting. I would hate to go to hell because I talk bad about two beautiful women. Marsh, I know you're watching. Spiritually gorgeous women, you know them. All right, so, all right. I'm going to get myself dug in so deep. 
Some need to accept and apologize. Listen, some of you need to accept the apology and move on so you can heal. You've been offended. You've been hurt. And that's real. Now listen to me. Some of you need to just move on because they'll never apologize. You just forgive them anyway and go on. That person that was so offensive years ago to me, to my family and to this church, have never apologized. But I learned a significant lesson. And it has no power over me anymore. I've been able to move on. Look at your neighbor and tell me you've got to move on. Whether they apologize and ask for forgiveness or not. Because some of them will never apologize. Hmm? It's true, gang. You know it is. Let me tell you this. Here's the flip side of this. We all need to let God strengthen us and grow us and mature us through the offenses. You need to get your peace and your joy back if you've lost them. And the victory is ours in Christ. Satan can't take that victory unless we surrender it. Don't give up your victory. Your victory's in Christ. Don't let the devil steal your victory. So you talk to God. If you need to apologize, then you need to do that. Repent. Repent means I'm not going to ever do that again. I'll never pray that prayer again. I will not do that again. I'm going to go this way. God, forgive me. If you need to apologize to someone, do it. It may be awkward. It may be a little... But you may set them free. They may not know that they need to move on whether you apologize or not. So if you can make it right, mend the fence. The devil's just... It's just a spirit of separation and division. Don't let your feelings get in the way. When you take that leap of faith, when you move and summon your will, and you just begin to seek and speak that forgiveness, feelings follow. Let's pray. And what I want us to do is to ask God to strengthen us through this. See, what happens when you learn to walk in wisdom? You learn how And you mature, God strengthens you and he grows you. Because offenses will still come. They'll still come. But what you can do is you can just say, listen, I'm not going to let that offense determine the trajectory of the rest of my life. I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not. Bitterness is to my soul what cancer is to the body. It will eat you alive from the inside. So, Father, we come before you. This is a heavy message. Next week's will be heavy as well. We believe that we're in these end times. From what we can see, we believe that there is an uptick, that there is an increase, no doubt about it, in demonic activities. There is a lot of It's demonic. It literally is like the maniac of Gadara. There's some of, some of the most insane stuff that's going on in this world, and it's being called good. And it's not. Offenses will come. But we have to fight the good fight. We need to fight in wisdom. To be as wise as a serpent, hmm, but harmless as a dove. But still fight. Resist the devil. Lord, there's sometimes that's just confusing to us sometimes. And when I get all into fight mode, Lord God, it it just I I mean it it's anger. But I need to know how to have righteous anger, a holy indignation. Strengthen us in that. That we could anger and sin not.
So, Father, we ask you to forgive us first. Quicken those that might need to apologize to someone and help them get free. Sometimes we don't even know that we need to apologize. So it will never happen. And I pray, Lord God, for those that were offended by something that we may have done or said or should have done. And we didn't even know that we missed it. Honestly did not know that we missed it. I pray, Lord God, for them that they could heal, that they could forgive, that they could get on past it. Strengthen us for these last days. We pray for wisdom. In Jesus' name. And everybody that agreed said amen. amen. Look over at your neighbor and tell them you don't look as puffy now. <laughs> amen. God bless you. We love you. <laughs> amen. So one of our wounded warriors that's been gone, we just got a message. He's back in U.S. airspace. And so he's been in a bad spot, been downrange. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Love you. Thank you for tuning in, watching today. God bless you. Go with Jesus. Walk in love. Walk in victory. God's got the best plan. Amen. No division, no strife. Wisdom or pride, I'll just choose wisdom. How about you? Amen. God bless. Have a great day in Jesus.